Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation and private equity, where we talk about the best way, the right way, the only way really to measure how leveraging growth equity drive private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run the Auxilia Mathematical website and I wrote the book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. This is video number seven in the value creation series where we really start to dig into leverage and its underlying drivers of cash flow generation and gearing. Now, many of the models used by GPs, LPs, and academics tend to confuse the change in net debt term with leverage, but it's easy to show that's not the whole story. To prove it, we'll look at a few different scenarios where debt or growth equity influence the return, but the net debt remains constant. Let's start with a $100 million company that has 50 of debt and 50 of equity. Because equity makes up half of the capital structure, it also has an equity ratio of 50%. Now we grow the company by 50%, but we keep the debt level constant. Both TEV and TechV will increase by 50, so they have the same change in absolute terms, but not in relative terms. We see here that the enterprise has a return multiple of 1.5x, but the equity has a return multiple of 2x. The difference here is entirely due to gearing. In levered deals, equity is smaller than enterprise value, so relative changes in TechV will be bigger than relative changes in TEV. This is how debt amplifies equity gains and losses in an LBO. These chi unlev and chi equity values are the logarithmic model equity return multipliers for the unlevered return and the total equity return described in VC105. And they're connected by the leverage effect, which is the equity ratio at exit divided by the equity ratio at entry. If you multiply the 1.33x leverage effect by the 1.5x unlevered return, you get the deal's total equity return of 2.0x. You can also plug these values into the derivative model of value creation described in VC104. This gives you an unlevered return of 29.2 and a leverage effect of 20.8. And of course, these add up to the total equity return of 50 million. The models work in the other direction as well. Let's start with a $150 million company and shrink it back down to 100. Again, in absolute terms, both TEV and TechV will decrease by 50, but the relative loss is greater for the equity. The enterprise has a return multiple of 0.67, while the equity has a return multiple of 0.5x. Just like debt amplifies gains, it also amplifies losses, and we see this with the leverage effect of 0.75x. As a reminder from VC105, multipliers that are greater than one create value, while those that are less than one, they destroy value. In multiplying the deal's unlevered return of 0.67 by the leverage effect of 0.75 shrinks it down to the total equity return of 0.5x. And again, you can plug these into the derivative model formulas, which add up to the $50 million loss in equity value. All right, now let's shift to a growth equity deal. In this case, your enterprise valuation is smaller than total equity because you have excess cash on the balance sheet to fund growth initiatives, and this provides a negative net debt number. As before, we'll grow the company by 50%, but keep the net debt constant at minus 10. Here again, in absolute terms, both TEV and TechV grow by 50, but in relative terms, now the equity value grows less than the enterprise value. The enterprise has a return multiple of 1.5x, while the equity has a return multiple of 1.45x. Effectively, the cash is a drag on the equity value growth, and the leverage effect explains this difference. Because the share of equity on the company's balance sheet decreases from 110% to 106.6, the multiplier is less than 1. And if you multiply the deal's unlevered return of 1.5x by the leverage effect of 0.97, you shrink it down to the total equity return of 1.45x. Plugging these values into the derivative model gives you an unlevered return that's 4.2 million higher than the total equity return of 50, and this is offset by a negative leverage effect of minus 4.2 million. Now, in all three of these cases, net debt did not change, so there is no cash flow generation. So we must explain the leverage effect with gearing. We have already proven that value creation can be broken into the unlevered return and the leverage effect that have these equations here. And we have suggested that the leverage effect can be broken into cash flow generation and gearing. What we don't know is the gearing equation. But we could solve for it because we know the leverage effect and we could assume that cash flow generation is equal to minus the change in net debt. Rearranging this formula suggests that gearing is equal to the change in the equity ratio times the average enterprise valuation plus the change in net debt. And do you know what? It is. Even though we're using a plug and backing into the value, this will give you the right answer every time. However, there's a better way to do it. 
It turns out the gearing is equal to the change in the enterprise valuation times the average holding period debt ratio. Now you might be thinking, how is this possible? Those expressions aren't even remotely close to one another. But you can actually prove it here with algebra, assuming you have about four sheets of paper and two hours to kill. This proves that they are the same thing. However, I gotta say that I find this approach a bit unsatisfying. My intuition certainly doesn't tell me that these two expressions are equal to one another. And the only way that I was able to do it was because I knew the answer and then I worked backwards, engaging in all kinds of algebraic trickery to make sure I landed at the right answer. So let's solve this thing from the bottom up like we did for the derivative model of value creation in VC 104. The key thing is to first recognize three useful properties of the equity ratio and the debt ratio. They are defined as the percentage of equity or debt in the company's capital structure as shown here. The first property is that the equity ratio and the debt ratio always add up to 100%, which is proven here. The next is that over a holding period, the average equity ratio and the average debt ratio also add up to 100%, which is proven here. And finally, over the course of any holding period, the change in equity ratio is always equal and opposite to the change in the debt ratio, which is proven here. Now, this may seem elementary, but this ability to convert equity ratios to debt ratios across holding periods will really help us out. With other ratios like the debt to equity ratio, you can't do conversions across holding periods because there is no common denominator. All right, let's go back to the derivative model of value creation. In the episode VC 104, we proved that the leverage effect for the GP or the fund was equal to the product of three numbers, the change in the equity ratio, the average holding period enterprise valuation, and the average holding period ownership percentage, or phi. This holding period expression came out of the instantaneous change expression where the change in equity ratio was a time derivative. Now we just showed that the equity ratio and the debt ratio always add up to one. So we can replace the equity ratio with one minus the debt ratio. Then the one goes away because the derivative of a constant is always zero. And this leaves us with this expression, which makes sense because in the last slide, we showed that the equity ratio changes are equal and opposite to debt ratio changes. Now our debt ratio at time t is net debt divided by total enterprise valuation, and both of these are functions of time, so we have to differentiate a quotient. Back in VC 104, we used the product rule to break up the value drivers. Here we must use another calculus 101 technique called the quotient rule. That says the expression is equal to the derivative of the numerator times the denominator minus the derivative of the denominator times the numerator divided by the denominator squared. You can try to remember that with a rhyme like low de high de high de low or something like that, but to play it safe, I'm just going to look it up every time. Now we see here that we have a couple of TEVs that cancel, which gives us the following, where we remember that the ND over TEV at any time T is the debt ratio. And what we're left with is this expression that says the leverage effect, which is driven by the instantaneous change in the equity ratio, is equal to the sum of two terms. One including the instantaneous change in the enterprise valuation and debt ratio, this will give us the gearing term, and the other including the instantaneous change in net debt, and this will give us our cash flow generation term. Now, as we discussed before, we don't know what these values are at every instant. We only know them when the CFO closes the books or when the GP publishes its quarterly report. So we replace the instantaneous changes with holding period deltas and averages as follows. Then we can cancel all the delta t's in the denominators to define the derivative model formulas for the leverage effect, gearing, and cash flow generation. We can see how everything fits together on the next slide. The gearing and cash flow generation terms add up to provide the deal's leverage effect, just like EBITDA growth and multiple expansion add up to provide the deal's unlevered return. Then the leverage effect and the unlevered return combine to provide the isomeric return. This is the dilution neutral return that the GP would have achieved assuming no change in its share of company equity ownership over the hold. And if you combine this with fund ownership impact, which measures the cost of dilution or concentration, you get the gross return for the deal. This is the same number that you'll find on the GP's marketing deck or on the fund's quarterly report. In the next video, we'll show you examples of companies that have both gearing and cash flow generation as value drivers and see how this approach compares to the conventional model of value creation described in VC 102 and the Munich model of value creation described in VC 103. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources 
like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on Amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.